On behalf of the College of Science and Engineering Alumni Board, I'd like to welcome all alumni and friends who are joining us today. My name is Jerry Sosinski, and I'm a CSE Electrical Engineering alumni. I serve on the CSE Alumni Board, which helps to connect CSE alumni, faculty, and students through events like this. We are pleased to bring you this webinar today by the University of Minnesota Rocket Team. The Rocket Team is a student-run organization that provides its members with hands-on engineering experience by designing, building, and launching high-powered rockets. They currently operate several exciting R&D type projects, including a high altitude shot and a thrust vector control system. They also compete in multiple competitions annually, including the Spaceport America Cup, the Space Grant Midwest High-Powered Rocket Competition, and the Bayer Elka Rocket Challenge. We are proud of the team for their most recent success in winning first place in their division of the Spaceport America Cup, as well as being declared the overall competition winners. I want to thank everyone for attending and continuing to be part of the life of the college. We hope you will enjoy the presentation today, tell your friends about it, and plan to come back again for our next alumni event. There is always something interesting going on at the U. Thanks so much, Jerry. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn things over right now to the Rocket team to get going with their presentation. So I'd first like to invite Caden to start us off. Go ahead and take it away, Caden. All right, thanks, thanks so much, Joelle, for the introduction. Let me just give me a second here to share my screen. All right, here we go. Thank you again so much, and thank you everyone uh, for joining us today on Homecoming Week uh, on our presentation here about our, our club at the university. Uh, here, I just want to go over the speakers in order really quickly. Uh, my name is Caden Turner. I'm the president of the Rocket Team. Uh, I'm a senior in aerospace engineering. Uh, next, we'll have Tyler Douglas talk. He is the Spaceport America Cup project lead. He is also a senior in aerospace engineering. Uh, then we'll have Nathan Belfi, uh, our high altitude project lead to talk. Uh, he is a junior in aerospace engineering. And then finally, we'll have Jeffy Jeffy wrap it up. She is our vice president and she is a senior in chemistry. A little bit of an agenda first. Um, we're going to go a, a bit over the club overview as well as some of the uh, smaller competitions and projects that we do. And then we'll talk more in depth about our two main projects. And then we'll wrap up with some non-technical -te stuff, uh, some stuff about how you can get involved and, and how to connect with us. So first with the overview, I think I just wanna uh, start with a brief history of the team here. Uh, so the Rocket Team was founded in 2012. We first started competing in NASA's USLI student launch competition, which is normally around 30 to 40 teams from around the nation that go down to um, Florida and, and launch a rocket there for competition. Um, however, as we started to grow, uh, the team wanted to create their own custom rocket motors. And to do that, so, uh, the NASA student launch competition wouldn't allow us to do that. So we instead moved to the Spaceport America Cup competition, which is formerly known as IREC. Um, and this also allowed us more chance for uh, recognition as well as the Spaceport America Cup competition is the largest collegiate rocket team or rocket competition uh, in the world. Um, currently, we have expanded to over 100 active members uh, and we have four active projects. So over the past few years, we started a high altitude project to launch a rocket as high as possible. Um, currently, uh, you know, we have some projects that are a little bit on hiatus, like the Alka Bayer competition, um, which is launching a seltzer tablet powered rockets from seltzer tablets and water as high as possible. Um, that competition has been canceled due to COVID last year and it's not happening this year. Um, we're unsure of the future of that competition, but uh, because of that competition, which we won multiple years in a row, the University of Minnesota rocket team has the world record for the highest altitude achieved uh, of a uh, rocket powered by Alka-Seltzer tablets. So if you want to find us in one of those awesome books uh, about world records, you can find us there. Um, additionally, we also have eight sub teams uh, throughout the team. We're sort of split into eight sub teams. 
Um, and really, we're just designed to uh, focus on a way for students to be involved in rocketry, both as a hobby and as a career. Um, and we have a large focus on custom design and manufacturing of all of our parts. So we try and uh, design and manufacture things as custom as possible or as, as we're allowed due to competition rules. Our, our slogan is making rockets, building engineers, of course. So we make rockets, we're building engineers, both uh, through the experience that they get and through the knowledge of talking with different industry professionals that they get through the rocket team and different networking opportunities. So, um, you know, we really strive to provide um, an opportunity for students to get both leadership experience and technical experience when they're on the rocket team here. Um, and I think we do an excellent job with that. Uh, also, the rocket team is just plain fun. So every year we um, go down to Spaceport America Cup, which is in New Mexico. It's a 20 hour road trip. We can't really fly there. Um, you know, these previous couple of years with COVID, things have been a little wonky. The competition has been canceled. And then uh, this past year, the competition was online. But generally, that's what we do. And this past summer, just a few weeks ago, we were actually able to make a trip down to Southern California uh, to the Friends of Amateur Rocketry site. Um, and that was a 28 hour drive, two day trip there, two day trip back, um, week long trip in total. And it's just a, a fun thing to do. Um, and it provides opportunities for our members to get out there, um, do some networking when they're out there and just also make really good friends. Um, again, so uh, because the virtual or because the Spaceport America Cup competition was canceled last year, we still wanted to provide an opportunity for members to get launch experience and have fun. And so this picture on the right you see is uh, us flying just at North Branch, Minnesota, about an hour north of here uh, with our large rocket. Uh, this was a really great experience for a lot of people. It was a lot of people's first launches. And because we were so close, we were able to bring parents and stuff like that. And so it was just a really good time and it's something we hope to do in the future as well. Uh, but additionally, you know, we do other fun things outside of our competition. This picture on the left you can see is our, our night launch rocket. So just uh, this past month, um, the club up in uh, North Branch, Minnesota had their annual night launch, uh, which is a really fun, cool thing to do. If you want to see it, it's every, every uh, September, every year. So, um, you know, if you want to come out and see some rockets fly at night uh, when they're all lit up and have these lights and see the, the awesome rocket motor exhaust uh, at night, it's a, it's a really fun thing to do. Uh, and, you know, who has fun on the rocket team? Well, everyone has fun on the rocket team, right? Anyone can have fun on the rocket team. Uh, we have lots of different majors, backgrounds, and experience levels. So what you'll see is, um, sorry about that noise, but what you'll see is that uh, a large portion of our students are aerospace engineers. However, we still have people from all different majors across the university, including non-CSE majors. So we have, I've seen architecture majors, communication majors, uh, some sort of business or, or economics majors, because um, we need those students for our communications team and stuff like that. Uh, but you'll also see lots of different majors. So we have chemies, mechanical engineers, comp sci, um, that sort of thing. And then additionally, we have lots of different years represented on our club. Um, we are mostly an undergrad club, but we do have some uh, postgrad students as well. So PhD, master's students, that sort of thing. Um, and we welcome those students. Um, you know, recruitment's been a little bit down because of COVID this past year and the move to online. And so what we're finding this year is we're going to be starting to transition to sort of a young team, uh, which provides a lot of opportunities for new members uh, for leadership experience and the like. Now I want to quickly go over some of our smaller projects. The first one is our Gopher Academy. So this is sort of an introductory program for new members to introduce them to the basics of high power rocketry. Um, and so how this is structured is that for around five to six weeks, we have sort of um, lectures or informational talks um, where different sub team leads come in and give their their information about their sub team and, and how how different parts of the rocket come together. And then after that, uh, we sort of break into small groups. So we have groups of four or five who then build um, a small high power rocket, uh, which is sort of a, a level one rocket. There's different levels. Um, and those mentors are, you know, consist of experienced members on the team. So this year we've had over 80 new students um, join Gopher, which is a record number for us. And we're hoping to uh, keep the momentum going and, and uh, provide a really great experience for those students. And then finally with Gopher, uh, also every week we have, you know, internship talks. So every week we'll have somebody come in and talk about their internship. 
um, their experience during their internship, advice on how to get an internship, um, and just general knowledge about the different opportunities that you have out there in the inter internship world and the industry. Um, and I think that's a really valuable experience that a lot of new members uh, really appreciate. Uh, here you can see the picture on the left is actually just a picture from a, a week or two ago um, with that first gopher meeting of over 80 new students um, interested. And on the right is an example of the type of rockets that they would build. These are some gopher rockets from previous years. And you can see some pretty cool paint jobs. Um, you'll always see some awesome paint jobs come out of gopher. A lot of uh, student, a lot of different groups like to compete with each other on uh, who can have the best paint job. And it's really just a, a really fun time all around. Uh, the other smaller uh, project we do is the Midwest High Powered Rocketry Competition, which is sponsored by Minnesota's Space Grant Consortium, which is a, a NASA sponsorship as well. Um, this is actually a local competition in North Branch, Minnesota, like I've mentioned before. It's about an hour north of here off of I-35 uh, North. And so every year there's a unique design challenge that the team has to build and create. Um, this competition is a little bit of a smaller competition and that we're, we're building sort of a smaller rocket, um, but it's, it's still a great time. It provides valuable experience. And what you'll find is a lot of new members tend to gravitate towards the, uh, the Midwest competition. And additionally, you know, we do really well in this competition as well. So we won it in 2019 and we also won in 2017. And now because of their success and hopefully because uh, of our continued need um, we also are going to be transitioning this, this competition team to also be uh, developing some test rockets for other projects as well. Um, so really a lot of opportunity, um, even if you just want to stay local or stay on a smaller project here. Um, and there's some really awesome, unique design challenges. Here's an example of a previous uh, competition winning rocket at that Midwest competition launching off the pad. Uh, I believe this was, I don't know if this was 2019 or 2017, but it was one of those years. All right, and now I am going to hand it over to Tyler Douglas, our Spaceport America Cup project lead. Again, he, has, he is a uh, senior in aerospace engineering and mechanics. Thanks, Gaden. Uh, like Caden mentioned before, the Spaceport America Cup is not only the largest competition that the University of Minnesota rocket team competes in every year, but it's the largest competition in the entire world for college rocketry. As you can see by this infographic of last year's participants, there were over or 16 countries from six, uh, from six continents with over 75 teams. On a usual year, the Spaceport America Cup attracts over 150 teams. The Spaceport America Cup is located at Spaceport America in New Mexico. Spaceport America is the world's largest purpose-built commercial spaceport. And what a spaceport is, it's basically a location in the middle of the desert where the rockets can't reach any cities. And they have a waiver to space, so we can launch our rockets as high as possible. As you can see, this facility is state-of-the-art, modern, and super nice. So during that week in June, all of the 150 teams flock to Las Cruces, New Mexico, along with a good portion of the country's aerospace sector. And we all meet for a large networking event and a couple days to watch very large rockets launched to 30,000 feet and even higher with our exhibition launches. So a little bit of how the competition actually works. There's two main altitude levels. There is 10,000 feet and there's 30,000 feet. And there's a few different propulsion systems you can fly to each. There is COTS, which stands for commercial off the shelf. These are propulsion systems you can buy from a vendor or online. So those are solid propulsion, liquid propulsion, and hybrid propulsion. And there's also something we call SRAD, which is student researched and developed. Now these SRAD systems are very hard to do and fully designed here at the university and in conjunction with the bomb squad and their facilities in Rosemount. The University of Minnesota rocket team participates in the 30,000 feet SRAD solid rocket motor category. And I'm going to get a little bit into kind of what a rocket actually is and how we are able to compete in that category. So the rocket is very advanced and very expensive. So as you can see in this photo on the top left here, 
the vehicle's structure is mainly comprised out of carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is also seen in Formula One cars and supercars. This is a very lightweight, but very strong material, and it's super advanced and really awesome to use for our rocketry capabilities. Second, you can see to the right of that is our avionics unit. This is also, we call it the universal flight computer. And there's those little cards there are able to slide out and slide back in. So for different rockets in different years, we can slide in specially, specialized cards to be able to do what we want with the rocket. This next year, we're doing some very cool things that are called active control. And we can have little cards in there that understand where the rocket is and where it needs to go and then actuate certain mechanical systems to get us there. To the right of that, you see our propulsion system. Our propulsion system is the same type of solid propulsion that is seen on the strap-on solid rocket boosters of the space shuttle. We use a very similar formulation, but some state-of-the-art uh, hardware to get us where we need to go. Uh, the University of Minnesota's propulsion system is one of the most advanced in the entire nation for college rocketry. Below, you can see our recovery system. Our recovery parachutes are really awesome and made in-house. The recovery sub-team has a really uh, hard problem in which they have to design these parachutes on kind of a 2D paper, cut them out in 2D, and sew them together to make these 3D shapes. As you can see here, we have kind of a donut-shaped annular parachute. And to the left of that, you see our payload. Our payload this year is a large, massive biplane UAV. This UAV is deployed at 30,000 feet when our rocket hits Apogee and is able to glide around and understand where the rocket is. That way, if the rocket descends on the other side of a mountain range or under a hill, the UAV can transmit different communications back to the rocket so we understand where it is and can go find it. It can also do other aerial photography missions and uh, tracking. So a little bit about the team dynamic and how we actually all kind of come together to make this big rocket. The sub teams, which there are about eight of them, are meeting every single week, if not multiple times a week, to get their specific projects done. And then once a week, we also meet at something called an integration meeting. And at integration meetings, we all come together to talk about how our specific components are going to work together with others to all come together in this one modular rocket. Also, the rocket together has probably an involvement of around over 100 students throughout the course of the year. And the rockets take around six months to fully develop and fully build. Currently, we are in the design phase of the rocket for this next upcoming year. So we take about a couple of months to design the rocket and make sure we have an understanding of what the vehicle is gonna look like. Then we have something called a gate review in which we present this to industry panels and former alumni members who kind of critique our designs and help us make sure the rocket's gonna be a success. After that, we'll move into the design phase or the build phase and actually get building on this rocket. Once we get to a good point of building, we'll have another gate review to make sure that any problems that arose can get fixed. And then we'll move into the final test flights and the final flight of this rocket. So as you can see here, these are, this is an example of two of our competition launches. The one on the left there is the competition launch from 2019, and the one on the right is the most recent one from 2021. The 2020 competition was un, uh, unfortunately canceled. As you can see on the left there, that is an image of us at Spaceport America in New Mexico. That is one of our desert locations that we can launch at, one of around three locations that we can launch at in the entire United States. Uh, that rocket was called Thunderstrike, and it was launching an eight pound payload to 30,000 feet. Now the payload for that year was a little different than our new UAV payload. And it was actually a guided parafoil. So it was, if you can imagine, it was basically a little box with a parachute on top and we could pull the levers to guide it right back home uh, to where we were controlling it from. And on the right hand side, this is us launching in North Branch, Minnesota. We were still building a rocket for the 30,000 foot category, but had to, lower the propulsion system a little bit to make it to 20,000 feet because you can't go above 20,000 feet in Minnesota. So now I want to give a little overview and a little snapshot of what the 2021 launch actually looks like.
Yeah, so awesome. So as you can see there, we launched two rockets that day. We launched the 2021 competition rocket for the Space for America Cup, and we launched a test vehicle for our high altitude rocket. Uh, for our high altitude exhibition rocket, that is the trip we went all the way out to California to launch uh, a couple weeks ago, and that's something Nate's going to be touching on in just a little bit. Usually the SA Cup rocket and the high altitude rocket are launched both at the SA Cup competition. The high altitude rocket's just pushed a little further away from everyone and goes uh, not directly in the competition. We call it an exhibition launch, just kind of uh, for our own our own goals. And the results of the 2021 competition. So first off, we were the winners for the 30,000 foot SRAD solid category. That is one of the most advanced categories at the Spaceport America Cup. And that's the second year in a row that we have got first place in that category. And on top of that, we were awarded, we were awarded the overall competition winners out of all 75 teams from 16 countries from six continents. That is a really big deal. And we have beat out some really prestigious teams with really high funding. So that's a really, really big goal for us and a really big deal. And we're really proud of it. And looking into our future. So because we've won the competition and we've been so successful in the past, we're looking to make the next logical step in terms of technological innovation. We're taking our rocket, which was six inches in diameter, and bumping it up to eight inches. That's going to give us a lot more room to build bigger propulsion systems, have more control systems on it, and fly to, yeah, fly to higher altitudes. The coolest thing we're doing is something called active control. Active control is what you see with a lot of orbital rockets that control where it's at in space. And that'll make sure we hit exactly 30,000 feet. Hello everyone. My name is Nathan Belfi. I am the high altitude project lead and I am a junior in aerospace engineering. Next slide, please. So as, uh, as Tyler and Caden have explained, the High Altitude Project is a little bit different from the competition project. We focus more on the research and design of uh, a little bit more experimental rockets, and, and we're trying to push the altitudes of our rockets as high as possible. What the High Altitude Project allows us to do is it allows us to test and demonstrate and get more comfortable with some of the systems and the technology that we want to use in the future on the, comp on the competition rocket. And it also allows us to work on more innovative um, projects and, and new subsystems that we haven't really used before. Next slide, please. So our previous rocket um, was about 13 feet tall and it included an eight foot uh, motor section um, that was built by the propulsion team um, here at the University of Minnesota. Um, the predicted apogee for that rocket was 110,000 feet um, and it reached a uh, was predicted to reach a uh, top speed of Mach 2.8. Um, it included three what we call commercial off-the-shelf flight computers um, that were used to deploy two of our custom parachutes that was designed by our recovery team. Next slide, please. So we've been working on this rocket since fall of 2020. Um, we used the fall of 2020 for our designs and started um, manufacturing this rocket in the uh, spring of 2021 and all the way through the summer. Um, due to COVID um, and the virtual Spaceport America Cup, we weren't able to launch out in Spaceport America. And with a rocket of this size, um, there's really about three places in the United States that we're allowed to launch. And those locations are around the desert. And so on September 4th, uh, about three weeks ago, we were out in California at the Mojave Test Area. Um, and we were launching with the Friends of Amateur Rocketry um, unfortunately, also due to COVID, we could only take seven team members on the seven day trip, um, about 60 hours round trip um, to get to California and back. Um, that launch was pretty exciting. We successfully launched from the pad, um, but we experienced um, an increase in our angle of attack, which caused a structural failure at a well joint around 3000 feet, which caused the rocket to split into two. We were able to recover the top part of that rocket um, but the motor still had some propellant, regained stability, and it ended up somewhere in the desert. Um, next slide. Like I mentioned, uh, we are uh, an experimental rocketry team. And so, um, as you saw in the video, 
Um, that second launch was actually our second test launch. We did three test launches leading up to our September 4th launch in California. Um, and, and through each one of those test launches, um, we were able to improve and make uh, successfully better rockets and, and learn from some of the partial to full failures in each rocket and also the successes of some of those rockets, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, we did run simulations on most of those rockets, um, but we did find that simulations can only model accurate you know, predictions of what you think the flight characteristics and the building methods are. Um, and, and using some of these test launches, it allows us to um, test and fly some of the systems that we flew out in California before integrating them into our final high altitude rocket. Next slide, please. Um, team integration works very similar to the SA Cup competition team. Um, we utilize the same sub teams, um, but with slightly separate goals um, geared towards the high altitude team. Um, and, and by using integration meetings like SA Cup, we're able to make continual design updates with all of the sub teams and, and make sure that everyone's uh, working together and collaborating to, to make rockets like these a reality. Next slide. Um, the 2022 rocket, this upcoming rocket and, and future plans, we understand our failure in California quite well. Um, it was a failure at a weld bead. And um, from our previous uh, test launches, we understand um, and are confident in many of our other subsystems in the rocket. And so we are confident in making some design changes and iterations to that rocket that we tried to launch. And also um, watching the flight of our motor, we are pretty confident that it, it was successful. And so we're also planning on increasing the power of that motor to go higher than we've ever simulated bef uh, before. Um, to mitigate any of the problems that we have um, experienced in the past, we are working on um, doing some additional simulations and then also some different manufacturing processes, which we hope will uh, minimize the previous failure mode and then also just other problems and difficulties that we were having with the past rocket. And then for the future of the high altitude team, we are also planning on doing some two stage test rockets to prepare and, and learn some of the information we need for when we want to integrate that into the high altitude team. I don't know if y'all can see me, but um, hi, so I am Jeffy. I am the vice president of the team and I'm also a chemistry major. So it's kind of interesting how that works out. I've been really having a lot of fun being the team and just kind of um, learning how rockets work really. Um, next slide, please. So you've heard from Tyler and Nate um, and Caden about the technical parts of the team. And yes, that is important, but another really important aspect of the team that we really focus on is professional development. At the Rocket team, we really try to aim for a holistic experience for all of our students. That means helping them see uh, the importance of their technical skills, but also connecting them with industry professionals so they can get the most out of their experience. They can learn the more, learn more and also kind of reflect upon how these technical skills are gonna help them in the future as they go on to industry. Um, so this past year due to COVID, it was kind of hard for us to meet in the lab and actually work on the rockets as much. So what we did focus quite a lot on was um, getting industry speakers and panelists to come into our general meetings and talk to our students and let them know more about what kind of work they can do once they uh, are graduated and have you know gone into, into the industry. So we had research panelists, internship panelists, uh, folks from Virgin Galactic. We also had one of the former uh, found, former founding members of Rocket Team uh, come in and talk and an astronaut who was also a College of Science and Engineering alumni. So lots of different amazing people who would come in and talk to these students, give them more about, yeah, tell them about their experience and encouraging these students to look into some really cool professions that they can get into once they graduate. In addition, we also um, keep up with a resume book and a professional development book, both of which are available for anyone um, from industry who's interested in hiring our students or learning more about our students. Uh, these are ways for our students to easily get a job or an internship or whatever it is they're interested in or conduct an informational interview. Again, focusing on that holistic experience and letting them know that you know there is more to um, this Rocket Team experience. Yes, there's a technical part, but also there's the professional development part. Next slide, please. 
Along with professional development, we also focus quite a lot on outreach. Um, and specifically this year, we want to expand our outreach efforts more than we have done in the past. Um, I have been very lucky that I've been able to do the TRIO Upward Bound Outreach Program quite a few times now. Um, this is for students who are first-generation college students, students from low-income families, mostly from nearby Minneapolis area. And we're really just trying to show them what rocketry looks like. These are students who may not have had the resources or the information to understand what rocketry is or how they can use it, or that this is such a cool hobby and a career. So we get to, we show them all of our rockets. We show them like the different parts of it. And we try to encourage them to really look into this as a field, uh, the STEM field as a career. Um, in addition, we're also collaborating with the College of Science and Engineering for the Rooted in STEM program, which is also aimed at underrepresented students, um, students with underrepresented identities. And um, again, the goal is to showcase what career in STEM would look like and how they can best utilize, um, you know, plan out or utilize these resources that are on campus for the students. Um, and then some of the other things that we're looking into is also future outreach programs for this year, which is expanding a gopher program to high school students. The gopher was the same thing that Caden talked about in the beginning, which is the introductory program for um, students who are interested in the basics of rocketry. Um, we've had quite a few high school students from Minneapolis and uh, suburbs, suburban areas reaching out interested in rocket team and also just learning about the basics of rocketry while they're in high school. Um, so we would like, we are looking into maybe extending this program so students can learn more about basics of rocketry while they're in high school. In addition, we're also looking into collaborating with high schools that are in, the, um, again, in Minneapolis area so that they could have design challenges that would include the UF, something similar to the UFC thing that we did or the payload um, and similar things. So really just kind of uh, engaging with the community, showing or showcasing our work to the people around us, but also um, um, encouraging other people to look into rocketry as a career and hobby. hobby. And I would also like to point out that like, sure, this is a great way for us to showcase our work, but this is also a great opportunity for our students to kind of learn what this side of an organization looks like. And we're really proud that we're able to do this. Next slide, please. Along with the holistic, um, uh, holistic experience that I just talked about, we also, um, another part of it is the Rocky Team funding. We're a student group. Uh, most of our funding does come from the university or other organizations. We don't have you know, income coming into our organization just as um, the work that we do. So we have to apply for grants. What that means is that we have very limited amount of grants that we have, a very limited amount of funds that we have. And so it's our sub team leads or our project leads jobs to really think about, okay, this is how much money I have and how can I make the best out of it? And it provides, I honestly, I've seen some really amazing things. Like I always think that, oh, how am I gonna do this with this much money? And um, I'm always impressed by the innovation and the creative creativity that these leads show. And it's almost funny too, I don't think they realize that when they take the position of a lead that they're gonna have to deal with budget, but then, uh, then they do it and it, it's amazing how things work out. Um, and uh, it also, again, you know, providing that industry experience as well, because when you do go into the industry, I'm sure, as many of you already know that, you know, you have to think about the amount of money that you have. You have to think about the resources that we have. So I'm really glad that we're able to provide that opportunity. But speaking of resources, this is kind of how our funding works. We do not take any money from any of our students. Everything is completely grant by the university or just we just apply for grants or funding from other sponsors. Um, so our typical funding would look like about $60,000, but most of it coming from student services fee, which is the fee that all students pay. So we get a huge chunk from that. And then some of the other things we do is sponsors. We actually have a dedicated team of students who would reach out to companies, um, trying to you know tell them more about what we do and making a donor relationship so that we could get some funds that way. In addition, we also get some grants and support from the aerospace department, which is also incredible. Um, as far as expenses are concerned, most of the expenses do go towards material. And then another huge chunk is about travel expenses, which as Tyler and Nate both mentioned, it's an amazing time. Not many students have the opportunity to go see a rocket launch. And we're so glad that we're able to provide that opportunity for students and um, give them some really exciting memories. Next slide, please. So now that we've talked about um, the technical part, the non-technical part, the funding, um, some of the questions that we always get is how can you all get involved? Um, and then these are multiple different ways for everyone to get involved and be part of the team. 
starting with mentorship, we have uh, we have what seven, eight sub teams, and we're always looking for industry professionals to kind of guide us, help us plan out the team, and also just kind of shape our organization, specifically as especially as they're growing and becoming bigger. Um, so if you are interested, you're more than welcome to reach out to us, uh, serve as an advisor for the team, or mentor our sub team. Uh, one of our mentors, Gary Stroik, who actually was on the chat, he's an incredible, incredible support for the team. And I cannot imagine what the team would be if he wasn't around. So for sure, this is another opportunity, though. This is another way that people can get involved. In addition, corporate relations is another way that we encourage everyone to support our team is through industry speakers. So if you are working for an industry and you'd love to come and talk to our students um, and give them more information about your experience, we would love to have that as well and in supporting professional development. And I think corporate relation is super important because you know we only have also much reach, right? We cannot, um, we, we cannot, we, we can reach out to the immediate people and students around us, but for the, in the, for the community and for Minneapolis or for um, industry to really know what we are, we really rely on our corporate relations uh, for them to kind of tell like, companies or employers about what we do. Um, you can also join our mailing list, which we, uh, is a great way to keep up with what we do. Um, the trips we go on, uh, the places we, um, the new things that the team is trying. Um, and we also have a donation link for anyone who's interested in supporting, because I just mentioned our team is completely funded. Uh, we, we have to apply for grants and we, we, that's the only way that the team gets funded. Um, if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. We have that Google form, v.umn.edu slash RCT get involved, which we'll reach out to you back and we'll um, give more information as we need it. Next slide, please. All right, so this, I just, it's a very long quote, but this is uh, from an anonymous survey that we did, I think last year from uh, just kind of asking students about their experience on the team and if they have any comments or thoughts about how things are going. And this was from one of a fourth year student. And I think it's, it's kind of just encompasses everything that Caden said, Nate, Tyler said, Nate said, and what I said, um, which is, well, the student apparently was a con became a confident engineer and got lots of fun hands-on experience, became a better writer and a presenter and made some amazing friendships. And they never felt that as a female in the leadership that they ever had to prove themselves. And they blended their first and the second internship because of the involvement in the team. And honestly, that is it. That is what we try to do. That is the goal of the organization. And we're very proud that some of our students have that experience. Um, next slide, please. Awesome. So, Dao, thank you so much for hearing us. These are some of the ways that you can get a, that can get in touch with us. We do have a LinkedIn page, an Instagram page, a Facebook page. There should be a link for a website, um, but that's not there. But I think Joel put that in the chat. Uh, but those are some great ways that you can connect with us, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from industry, um, and we'd love to hear from alumni to learn more about um, or to just kind of look for more partnerships. Um, so. Yes, this is, um, thank you so much for hearing us. Thank you so much, Jeffy. So at this time, we're gonna take questions and we'll do as many as we can before one. If you haven't already shared your question, you can put it in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen and Jeffy's going to be directing those to her colleagues. So at this time, I'm gonna ask Tyler, Nathan, and Caden to turn their videos on and join Jeffy on screen uh, and go ahead and answer, answer some questions. Yeah. Um, so one of these questions actually is a Caden question. So I'm gonna um, ask Caden um, about recovery of the vehicle. So what is the minimum distance from the launch to landing achieved? And also if it's possible for a recovery such as like Blue Origin um, or is it impractical for our rocket? Right, yeah, so I assume um, the first part, I'll answer the first part of your question first about how far away or how close we land basically to the launch site. Um, and really that just depends on sort of the recovery setup that we have. So um, generally, especially when you're flying these high altitude rockets, so the rockets that we fly for the Spaceport America Cup and the high altitude projects, um, we use at least two parachutes and that's to minimize the amount of horizontal distance that we travel from the launch site to make recovery easier. So for example, for the SA Cup rocket, we have what's called a drogue parachute, which is a small parachute that deploys um, at top of the rocket's arc. And then once it gets to a lower altitude, around a thousand feet, uh, we deploy a larger parachute called the main parachute, which uh, slows the rocket down to a safe speed for landing, so the uh, speed that the rocket can actually survive so that we can recover it successfully, theoretically reuse it, and uh, also be able to full, pull uh, flight data off of. 
Um, as far as the minimum distance that we've ever gotten, I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, we don't really keep track of that. Um, generally, uh, you know, it could land at, you know, the higher you go, the farther it's going to drift away from the launch pad. Um, and then, you know, as, as far as rockets coming down like Blue Origin uh, or SpaceX or something like that, a lot of those rockets use propulsive landings. Um, which is a little bit impractical for uh, the rocket motors that we use. We use solid rocket motors, and uh, so those you know once you turn them on, you can't turn them off really, at least in not in any practical way. Um, there are people that have done it, uh, I believe, um, in small in small model rockets, um, but it's a little bit impractical as far as uh, doing that in terms of parachutes. Um, it could be possible. It was actually something that we were trying to do with the uh, previous Midwest competition, uh, the 2020 Midwest competition, which unfortunately got um, canceled uh, due to COVID. Um, so it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, we would have liked to see that happen. That rocket had landing legs that were going to deploy, and the recovery system was designed with specific parachutes, such to uh, to minimize the amount of sway as the rocket comes down. So hopefully, it would come down. Uh, just very straight and nice and land and, and be able to take photos. But unfortunately, we weren't able to see that rocket fly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question, I think I would direct it to Nate or Tyler, whoever wants to take it. Um, it's about the night rocket. So don't the addition of lights add drag to the vehicle and how do you mitigate that drag? Yes, yeah, so Tyler, if you don't mind, I'll take that one. Um, I was kind of overseeing the night launch rocket and we were using it as an opportunity to get some of our new members some experience. Um, and so with that rocket, there are actually some regulations that come with how high we can go um, due to it being at night and also the lower your altitude, generally the easier it is to recover. And so um, drag wasn't too much of a concern. Uh, so we kind of embraced it and just let it lower our altitude, um, which made it uh, an easier rocket for us. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a very exciting rocket and we just embraced the lighting and, and let the drag take hold. Perfect. Um, the other one is for, I would say Tyler, maybe, uh, does the team have any experience with hybrid propulsion systems or with multi-stage rockets? Yeah. So hybrid propulsion systems, uh, what hybrid is, it's you have basically a solid rocket motor on the bottom and you have liquid oxygen on the top and you're propelling the oxygen through your solid motor. The team hasn't really gone into working with liquid and cryogenic propellants, um, not really in the past and we don't really plan to in the future. We've really been succeeding with solid propulsion and we've really gotten to a point where it's uh, done everything we need. So we haven't really delved into uh, hybrid propulsion. Uh, two stage projects is something I'll probably toss over to Nate. Yeah, so we are looking into two stage uh, projects, but with our current um, propulsion capabilities, um, because we are trying to do so many projects, we are stretching ourselves thin um, in, in time and money. And so two stage is more of just a, an exploration thing right now. Um, we are hoping to launch a two stage rocket right now or this upcoming year um, to kind of explore some of those technologies and, and understand how it's gonna affect our vehicle and, and drag related to that um, and then hopefully in the future years um, we can do a two-stage on high altitude two team and just to clear things up really quickly uh if you're not aware of what a two-stage rocket is it's basically a rocket stacked on top of another rocket so you have a rocket that's firing a motor gets it up to an altitude and then they basically separate and the second rocket then lights its motor at a higher altitude. So you're sort of shedding some of the dead weight that you have as you expend fuel and that really increases your uh, efficiency. Awesome, thank you. Um, Tyler, so when instrumentation is, instrumentation is required for the competition and then are there any other metrics relevant for winning a competition? For example, if there's too much vibration during the climb, if it diminishes the scoring. Yeah, so the bare minimum you need is to understand where you are at Apogee to be able to deploy your parachutes and come down safely. And those are actually what we call commercial off the shelf deployment systems. They make sure you use ones that have been used thousands of times before because they don't want any rockets coming down without parachutes. But on top of that, we do add custom IMU sensors. We have something called pitot tubes that airplanes use to get uh, your velocity data. We use GPS data. 
And we use that to control active control systems on our rocket, to deploy little fins to increase our drag to get to 30,000 feet exactly, and to also spin up wheel to make sure that our rocket doesn't roll around and stays kind of right in place. Those are just additions, and those can really just improve your rocket's flight. But no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't see that your rocket is too much vibration um, and would uh, discount you on that in terms of points. I think the real thing is if you come down all in one piece and you could refly again, they're happy with it. Perfect. Um, and this one is probably a Kaden question. Uh, do you have any experience or know, do you know about VLEO? And um, is that something in consideration for the team? So VLEO in reference to like low Earth orbit or like 450 kilometer flights. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we, you know, as far as orbital flights, um, you know, orbital flights aren't something that we can really do um, as far as, you know, rockets going to space or to high altitudes, like above 300, you know, 300,000 feet above 100 kilometers. Um, that is something that we'd like to do in the future. Um, but also, you know, the difference between launching a rocket straight up and, and hitting space versus actually getting into orbit are two uh, very different things. And, and getting into orbit is much harder. It requires a lot more energy than just um, getting actually to space just for a short period of time on a suborbital tra trajectory. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the V the V of LEO stands for, but um, yeah. Yeah, so, so our, our team- I might touch on that very up. quick. Oh, sorry, Tyler. If I might touch on that very quickly. Um, VLEO is very low Earth orbit. Um, it actually starts at 492,000 feet. Um, and I've, I have looked into it. Um, in our current standing, it's, I believe, technically illegal for an amateur rocket to go into some sort of orbital um, path. But if we were able to branch out and make connections in the future and um, and had the funding to kind of make propulsion systems that are powerful enough for that, it, it could be in the future, um, maybe five, 10 years out. Yeah, our, our team competes in a lot of competitions. We do a lot of cool things. And right now, if we all combine together, join forces and built a space shot rockets get that high, we definitely could get to space relatively within a year or two. Um, it just takes time though and we'd have to split our competitions up and we're really not looking uh, to do that at the moment perfect um the next question is about the most unusual major background of a team member and i think i'm going to take that one um i'm actually a chemistry major and you would think that chemistry is actually useful to the rockets since you know propulsion uh, but my background is in drug design and discovery uh, so uh I, I definitely took a little bit of a turn there um, and I, if to add on to that, I actually do the, did the, I was a treasurer last year and now I'm the vice president. So um, chemistry, drug design and discovery, and also money somehow added up together to be rocket team. <laughs> Is there anyone else you guys can think of who has an unusual major? I know somebody was on the recovery team for a year or two uh, with an architecture major. Mm, yeah, that was a little bit that. unusual. But yeah, we had a cool. biomedical engineer launching a high rocket for a year. <laughs> Yeah, and I think one member in um, the finance up team, well, it was the finance up team, but they were like a county major or something like that. So yeah, very closely related. I would say that, you know, there's a room for everyone in the team. We don't ever require any sort of experience. Um, so students are more than welcome to join. If just, as long as they're interested in rocketry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, one last question I think I would say is, has the team considered con trying a high altitude balloon launch rocket that is called a raccoon? <laughs> Oh, by Professor Flatten. Yeah, that is something we have considered before. <laughs> yeah, we we have we always have kind of an annual design discussion of of how we can maximize the altitude of our high altitude rockets, and it always comes up of how can we start the launch of the high altitude rocket um, further up into the atmosphere. So balloon launch or sometimes even uh, there's some commercial companies that are, are launching from um, planes or that sort of thing. Um, so it, uh, it does come up. It, it tends to be a little bit beyond our scope, but uh, it's always a fun discussion when we have it. Perfect. Um, now that we have some time, I think um, if one of you can just go around and just say what's the best experience of the team that you have had in the past three years or so, um, so yeah, it's fun if we can do that. 
Oh, that's a really tough one, Jeffy. I think my, my favorite part is when we work directly with the bomb squad. Um, you know, we're doing, we're working with some pretty volatile chemicals and we kind of want to be out in the middle of nowhere and we actually get to use their facility. So whenever we're doing our test fires, I invite my parents, I invite my friends and they show up and the bomb squad guys all show up in their tinted out vehicles and they come to watch. Uh, we use their facility. We have really long uh, launch operations. And it's just a really fun time to have everyone kind of come and see what you do. Uh, so that's kind of my favorite part is doing really cool things, but then having to actually have people see the cool things I'm doing because we launch and test fire so few times a year. That's really fun. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just jump in here and, and share my, my favorite part as well, um, just real quickly. <laughs> um, I, for me, I really enjoy actually getting out and, and doing the trips with the team. Um, you know, unfortunately with COVID, we haven't been able to do as many trips as we have in previous years. So, um, you know, for example, this year, even just going up to North Branch, um, with the entire team when we launched our, our Space for America Cup competition rocket with the whole team uh, and parents got to come and stuff like that. And we got to you know, show off to them exactly what we've been doing all year and showing off that hard work. And, uh, you know, it's just a really great time having everyone up there and everyone's having fun and, you know, seeing everyone smile on the team is, is really worthwhile. So. Yeah. Ethan, anything yeah. you want to add? I think my favorite part um, is actually the days leading up to the launch. Um, oftentimes, um, there's a lot of people all working on their individual projects in our, in our lab. And we just have such a great community of people that when everyone's in the lab all working, we just have a fantastic time um, getting the, rep, the rockets in their final preparation state and ready to go. Jeffy, do you want to share your favorite thing or memory before I close us out? Uh, I think I just really enjoy the community. made it all the way to the end before anyone froze up. Uh, looks like we've lost Jeffy there for a second. Jeffy, you're back. Do you want to share? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, I was just saying that um, I really enjoy the community that um, I've been able to form here. I really enjoy working with these guys and it's so much fun. Like, you know, just some like weird things come up and then finding a solution to those problems um, has been really fun. Thank you. Well, I want to take a moment to give a huge thank you to Caden, Tyler, Nathan, and Jeffy for being with us today and sharing all this information about their amazing work and all the work that the Rocket team does together. Uh, I, I can't imagine better student representatives for our college going out into industry and the world and being the future scientists and engineers uh, of tomorrow. They're really wonderful examples of what our students are doing today in the college and the many opportunities for hands-on work that they have. Uh, the Rocket team is, is a great example of that. So thank you for making time to present to us today, all of you, we really appreciate it. And as a reminder to everybody, uh, in about a week, we'll be sending out a follow-up email that'll have a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as all the links that the students shared during their presentation. Uh, the, the link is just to the college YouTube channel. Anyone can watch it. So if you enjoyed the presentation today and you think that there are others you know who would also appreciate it, please feel free to forward that email along or share that link. Um, we're always happy to have more people watch uh, these presentations after the fact and hear the great work that our students are doing. So before we go, I'd like to briefly announce the next virtual event coming up through the college. You can learn more and register now for this next event at z.umn.edu slash 2021 CSE Public Lecture. And it's coming up on October 19th at noon and will also be over Zoom. This is the first installment of a brand new public lecture series the college is launching called Rising to the Moment. And this first uh, installment is going to feature uh, Biomedical Engineering Associate Professor Chun Wang, who you may have heard about recently in the news. This, this new technology has got quite a lot of press in the last few months. He's developed a polymer wafer technology that you place under the tongue. And when you do that, it can effectively deliver and preserve protein-based vaccines. And this research could open the door for vaccines that can be more easily produced and distributed to communities around the world. So I hope you'll join us for that event coming up on October 19th. Uh, and there's lots more events happening at the college. You can always learn about all of our upcoming events at csc.umn.edu slash events. Uh, and if we can switch to the final slide, um, 
I'll share my contact information. If you ever have any questions about upcoming events or how you can get involved with the college, uh, you can always contact me at cscalumni at umn.edu. Uh, so with that, I wanna just give a final huge thank you to all of our presenters today for making the time uh, to share all this information with us. I hope you all check out their website and uh, look, look for ways you can get involved or stay in touch with them going forward. Uh, so thanks to our presenters and thank you to all of you for making time out of your day to attend this webinar. And we hope to see you at another sometime soon. Uh, in the meantime, happy homecoming week. Take care and have a great afternoon.